So before presenting to you or um, giving the floor to the uh, speakers, Jean-François Dupé, who will be the official speaker, um, who will be accompanied by Melissa Caron, his colleague from the Cégep de Grande-B, as well as uh, Marie-Estelle Depp from uh, Bois de Boulogne and Marianne Veillette from the uh, Cégep de Grande-B. Um, well, Jean-François Dupé has an undergrad degree in uh, outdoor activities and adventure and a master's in philosophy from uh, University of Sherbrooke. He is a specialized outdoors guide specializing in youth services. And that's where he discovered his passion for experiential teaching. From 2012 to 2015, he worked uh, as a logistician um, for uh, Medics Without Borders. This shows him the importance of critical thinking and pushes him towards philosophy, a research assistant for the Chaire de Recherche du Canada in practical epistemology since 2015. He has been teaching philosophy at the Cégep de Grande Bay since 2017, and he is a member of the Interior University Research Center on um, Science and Technology. So I'd say to you, have a good webinar, everyone, and the floor is yours, Jean-François. First of all, thank you very much, Nicole. I'm very happy to be here today, although I won't hide it from you. I'm a bit stressed out by all of this, but I'm I'm very happy to be here, though, um, to be here and to be able to present this project today. today. So um, I'll just make sure before I start my presentation, can you confirm you see my screen well, Nicole? All right, good. So I imagine that it is the case. Yes, absolutely. Perfect. Thank you, because I, I can't see you so... Perfect. Um, now I will speak to you about the NUS project. I will explain to you where it comes from. It is a network to combat misinformation in a 101, philosophy 101, but it's also the idea of combating um, misinformation through uh, college education in general. So people who contributed to the project are, uh, first of all, my friend Melissa Caron, teaching at the Grand Cégep de Grande as well, marie Martel, a professional journalist who is a president of the Association of uh, Professional Journalists of Quebec. So marie she is there. Uh, you see her on the photo. And I also have the pleasure of working with Andréa Veillette at the Cégep de Grande B and uh, um, marie Estelle Debs from Bois de Boulogne. We're testing out the project, working on the project. There is also the uh, Research Chair of Canada on Practical Epistemology who is supporting us and the Cégep de Grande Bay. And so before I start, I want to tell you that I am very happy to see how many people have joined today. Uh, there are some people joining in from, you know, they're teaching chemistry, people teach uh, working at Election Quebec in T Tunisia, um, documentation technicians. I'm very happy to read all of that. So the idea is to show you, if possible, what the pro how the project could um could be used generally to teach uh, um, participative technology and critical thinking uh, in all spheres of our society. So um basically, the plan for our presentation today is uh, I will present the pedagogy pedagogical principles of the project, uh, the journalistic basics of the project, then uh, the epistemic basis and uh, the project, the observations and results, uh, uh, and we'll have an exchange. Um, here at uh, the news project, uh, we're not big fans of PowerPoint presentations, but because we're working remotely, this is the means that we chose, right? So I will present the project in 30 minutes tops, and then after that, we'll have 30 minutes of exchange because we think that uh, because of uh, mixed education that I want uh, to talk about um, later, it's very important to be able to hear you and exchange with you, share things, right? So if I talk about the birth or the start of the project, there are two elements uh, that are at its origin. Um, so, and I assure you, this is not a photo of my class, but sometimes it kind of looks like that. But the attitude of students towards uh, college education, uh, be it in philosophy or other fields, I have... Uh, have uh, observed certain things there, and there's also a lot of misinformation. Um, so Madison Welsh here, you can see his photo. He had come into the ping pong pits area um, in the United States with a semi-automatic weapon to supposedly free some children who were sequestrated in a, a basement there by a pedo-satanistic uh, 
cult. Uh, there was not even a basement in the um, uh, pizza shop after all. So he ended up going to uh, jail for four years. He had very good intentions, though, but he'd come to that conclusion because of stuff he'd seen on the Internet. And uh, so we see that misinformation and um, students uh, disengaging. This is what I've noticed in my classes. Um, these are two problems that could present a solution um, for one another. Right. So this is how the project uh, was created. Nus. Where does Nus come from? It is a Greek term that means intelligence or reason or rationality. And the project that up to not long ago, it was the Collaborative Digital Journalism Project or Nus. And um, its objective is to uh, teach pedagogy, journalism and epistemology and teach critical thinking by creating re reliable media content through this. Um, so before I show you what the network that we're trying to put together looks like, I'll tell you that in CEGEPS, there are students, teachers, but there's also a lot of people surrounding the students. Uh, it can be uh, orientation advisors, uh, uh, librarians, etc. And in the research world, there are people in epistemology uh, education that support us because it is um, a pedagogical project, but also a research one. There's people from the uh, world of journalism as well that are uh, supporting us. We're working with the um, CQMI. We're working with uh, some journalism uh, journalists as well. So the network does comprise some journalists, some researchers, and some uh, individuals from the uh, college network. Uh, so I don't want to drag or speak too long about this, but the idea is to uh, give you an idea of what influences us in our decision making. So pedagogically, uh, we're trying to develop uh, um, uh, multidisciplinary thinking skills. Um, so critical thinking and multidisciplinary thinking are not exactly the same thing, but we can do make act. Also, uh, We want to consider that in the community there are a lot of needs, and that is an uh, that is a pedagogical opportunity. So we're trying to fight against misinformation because we know that there is a huge production of misinformation, and journalisms on their own will never be able to um, respond to this misinformation or fight it completely. Um, so now this uh, uh, is related to participatory journalism so that citizens can participate to journalism. There was a, a research published in 2018 uh, saying that participatory journalism was a good way to um, develop uh, uh, democratic participation and critical thinking. Epistemology also, uh, collective intelligence. It, it's important to say that if students, uh, if we want them to if we want them to uh, take part in uh, participatory journalism, we don't want them to take part in more misinformation, right? If they are misinformed, we don't want them to uh, spread more misinformation. So there is a collective intelligence notion that is very known in epistemology, and it says that under certain conditions, we can use the group and certain technologies to reduce um, the production of material that would not be reliable. So one of the best examples of this is Wikipedia, right? But we could also have some other examples, and we're trying to put that in place um, at this level of our students. Um, so we're trying to identify the conditions for possibility of collective intelligence, considering that we're working with uh, youth from this from CEGEP. So um, the skills that we're aiming at, uh, uh, I'll just go over this very fast. But the point is not to have a complementary course, right? It's to use Philosophy 101 um, and integrate uh, this content in order to reach the competencies, the skills that are already identified for Philosophy 101. Um, so it'll help us distinguish philosophy from other forms of discourse, uh, um, present uh, the contribution of philosophers from the uh, Greek a Latin tradition on certain questions and produce an argument uh, regarding philosophical questions. And here, this may interest you. 
Um, because you're working in education, it is an article by Philippe Avrami, and he basically looked at the factors that would uh, positively influence the development of critical thought. And one of the factors, the central factors, was mixed education. Um, so the idea of mixed education is that you need to use an implicit and an explicit approach, both, uh, when you teach. So what uh, uh, implicit is what I'm doing right now. Uh, so it's a transmission of knowledge. Uh, for example, explicit then would be to have a, uh, a blackboard and just uh, have different fallacies written there. And um, that is a known method, a known method, and it can really help you acquire some skills. But if you add an implicit um, aspect, uh, it will allow the students to actually use some uh, content that they have uh, learned in class. So what I'm doing now actually is explicit. But for example, if uh, I were to be implicit, I would ask the students to exchange among themselves or create fallacies themselves. Um, so uh, mixed education is at the heart of the presentation today. And this is why I'm going through this very fast. Um, so it is at the heart of our approach. And... Um, so another aspect that's very important uh, is the uh, thinking abilities. Uh, this really boils down to, um, for example, breaking down the movements of uh, breathing or walking. You know, these are things that we don't realize that we do anymore, right? But if you really break them down, these actions, um, you can, after that, uh, do them in in full awareness, right? So uh, you can use uh, this method of full awareness with your thought as well. Um, so for example, you can summarize question, um, formulate hypotheses, uh, give examples. And so you can have these mechanisms work implicitly um, as well as explicitly. And here uh, it is applied to news. Uh, so just to give you an idea of the um, skills that we retained, there are about 20 um, that uh, we kept or that we listed according to us when we work on these abilities, that is for um, Philosophy 101. So we based ourselves off of the, uh, minist uh, the ministry's outline. Um, and uh, so these are the three pillars and we associated these uh, with the thought abilities or thinking abilities that we will be developing. So if you want us to uh, break down these elements, we, went, we can do that afterwards and uh, no problem. Um, now, participatory journalism, I just want to say that we're not inventing anything. So if we look at the side of uh, uh, the United States, uh, PBS, Students Reporting Labs, um, Media Parks, uh, these are all spaces where there's already a relationship between education, journalism, and the media. And uh, when we're asked, so we're working on a philosophy course to give it more of an authentic vibe, right? And so the explicit part is what we always see, we've already been seeing in philosophy classes, but the implicit part uh, is this other part we want to work on. And uh, all of these uh, news items can be tied to uh, philosophical questions in the end, and that's what we may talk about a bit more later. So um, here, um, a predictive approach. Uh, these are examples that I pulled out of uh, Hyperminds on the 14th of September. And basically, these are people that on a market will answer uh, certain questions. So for example, to the right, will Vladimir Putin uh, uh, remain as the president of Russia until the 31st of December, 2023? And um, so people can vote here and people who obtain the right answer, this will make the um, market fluctuate um, in function of uh, what comes true uh, in current news and current affairs. So for very complex questions, it is very clear that uh, people organized as a network will be better. Just ordinary people organized as a network will be better than network. Uh, than than experts and here this is an article um 
from 2021 and it said uh, that basically we could use the wisdom of the crowds uh, to to do fact checking and uh, what they did here is that they checked if groups of people whose analysis we would aggregate if they could do as well as professional fact checkers so what they did is that they did three uh, they took three professional fact checkers and uh, asked them for their opinion on hundreds of articles and then we took several people in a group whom we would give uh, uh, the lead and the title of an article and then we would ask them do you think that that is a real or a fake article and when we would aggregate uh, the data for 26 people or more, uh, we would reach a point where they would do as well together as fact checkers. And where it is very interesting then is when we think about the number of students that we have in our classes, right? They are around 26. So now I will skip to the project itself. So the project is to see philosophy and rationality as an opportunity to combat misinformation. But it's also just, you know, college education as a whole, as an opportunity to combat misinformation and um, an opportunity to teach uh, um, democratic citizenship. So what we want is to reach the skills stated by the Ministère de l'Education um, while fighting misinformation. So first step, uh, we concentrate on prediction. I'll give more details regarding that. Why would we do predictions in philosophy? Well, this is based on Philip Daedlock's work, who's a, a Canadian uh, psychology researcher. Um, and uh, his uh, specialty um, was uh, the intelligence uh, advanced research project uh, intelligence in the United States, basically. So he was looking at uh, what the conditions were, the best conditions were for people to actually be able to predict events accurately. So questions that these people in the intelligence community were asking themselves was, uh, you know, by this date, will Korea or North Korea um, be holding the, this type of activity, et cetera, et cetera. And so there was um, a contest for that uh, Philippe Tesla uh, organized, but without having access to a secret information, he, he was able to beat um, the uh, American United States intelligence community. So um, he uh, put together a software where people could discuss it among themselves and uh, they had a methodology, uh, an algorithm to reduce bias and make sure that they would come out with the best possible predictions. Um, so here we have a question uh, asking, uh, for example, will Russia military invade Ukraine by 8 a.m. East on uh, February 21, 2022? Uh, here, I asked this question to my students and they had predicted that no. And uh, the it was true. The answer was really no, but we did have some predictions regarding very things that were very close to us, right? For example, will uh, François Bonnardel win the Grand B writing with twice as many votes as his closest rival? Um, the Prediction was yes, my students answered that yes, and uh, the result in the end ended up being yes. We worked on the Habs, Montreal Habs. We also worked on the uh, the 67, Bill 67. We were asking ourselves this if uh, Bill 67 was to, actually it was to force uh, cities to accept uh, Airbnb in their neighborhood. So they're not allowed anymore to um, prohibit Airbnb type rentals on their territory. So we're asking ourselves if, if on May 15, 2023, uh, some cities would um, ratify, pass a bill that would allow them to avoid the new law. So we came up with a prediction that was no, and the result uh, was indeed no, uh, but there are cities that did make that attempt. Um, so now we're skipping to a whole new thing altogether. Uh, will the Oppenheimer film uh, win more Oscars than the Barbie film? For example, a student prediction, very low yes, and the objective result, uh, well, we'll see later. Um, so uh, the prediction sequence, I'll go through it very fast. First of all, we uh, look at preliminary questions. 
um, all questions require that we answer sub questions. So if you look at the um, Barbie movie and the Oppenheimer movie, um, you can uh, look uh, who is making up the juries at the Oscars, et cetera, et cetera, what they've done in the past. So different uh, uh, teams in the classroom will do uh, different researches and then they will offer, so they'll search for information and they'll give their first individual prediction before deliberation. So they give their answer, uh, zero is an absolute no, a hundred is an absolute yes. And then there's a bunch of other possibilities between the two. I just asked them not to put 50 because it's useless, right? So um, people who are tending towards uh, Yes. Well, I, I, I asked them to back to support their answer there, just provide an explanation for the answer. So um, if they have any uncertainty, uh, I asked them to explain their uncertainty here. And so usually they uh, come up with counter arguments and they can evaluate if the value of the prediction is the right one. And um, here uh, we do a pooling of information, right? If we're talking about the Oscars, we're going to understand how uh, the academy works, who can vote, etc. And then either we work with the board or with a Kialo and we do, we form a research community. Um, so I give you two examples. So the first example, uh, we did it um, as uh, with this question about Bill 67. And here you can see that students can uh, write their arguments down here. So for or against, yes or no. And then they can actually rank the value of arguments and um, to make them, to push them up in the ranking and uh, they can add information, et cetera. So this leaves a trace of what the exchange is leading up to our group conclusion. And then uh, this looks like what's been done last week at the AQPC. Uh, there is on Kialo a debate that's going on regarding or asking um, whether ChatGPT will be will do more good than bad. So here you have four against or yes or no, and then the answers of people who are um, four, and then well, there you go, people who are contradicting uh, these people, et cetera, et cetera. And then here you have uh, eight, uh, 491 um, texts or arguments that are written. There is uh, uh, 1,700 participations by only 32 people, but 8,400 8, people who viewed all this. So we would have the possibility of publishing um, based on this content, a journalist would be able to view what has been done by students and actually use it uh, as a basis. And then students uh, from different CEGEPs, different uh, regions would be able to work on certain topics long term. So I uh, will speak to you about rationality analysis very fast. So I'm very happy to know that you're all here, but there, there is also someone um, from Election Quebec. So we asked students to go uh, find a topic that interests them, um, but that where there are arguments going on, right? So fundamentally, uh, philosophy teachers should be interested in arguments. So they'll go, um, they'll go to a conspirationist, a conspirationist video online, for example. Um, for example, they can go to small claims court. Uh, they can go uh, see what's going on at their students' association, um, and just see what what whoever is bringing as an argument to defend a certain position. So I asked them to summarize uh, remarks, uh, explanations, and then analyze, uh, analyze using um, rationality con criteria. Um, and then they submit it to peers. So I asked them to do that with people from the outside because dialogue is interesting uh, when you ha have it with uh, your parents, your grandparents, uh, friends from outside, etc. Once you have feedback from your peers, then uh, you can self-correct and then there can be an exam on that. So the idea here is for people to go get some arguments. And now um, I don't encourage students to use conspiration uh, videos, uh, conspiracy, conspiracy videos, um, because uh, there the argumentation becomes very social. 
Um, and so uh, to end, um, the uh, notice of interest is that uh, students are asked to identify a problem, then conceptualize and problematize around this topic and uh, um, argue, formulate arguments, and, and then to universalize. And this is a plan for a, an argumentative essay, right? These outlines can be made available to journalists or also be used to um, write open letters. So uh, the important part here is that we do this step by step. It lasts four weeks, and then each week there is a document where students um, progress and uh, I work as a facilitator uh, in the classroom and I guide them through the different elements, right? So this has led us already to one um, publication, Elisano published uh, in La Voix de l'Est a few weeks ago regarding a philosophy class um, she lost consciousness during a philosophy class as she left in an ambulance. And then when she came back, the other students were very surprised and, and shocked to learn that she was going to have to pay $300 for uh, the ambulance service, right? So she's asking this question about, you know, being a student and uh, living in a democracy, how does it work that you have to uh, pay for healthcare, health services like these ones, right? So that was a very interesting uh, topic. Now I will end with my observations or with our observations um, regarding the three years that we have led this project. So regarding pedagogy, the sequence of this session, the semester, is that first of all, um, you uh, talk about uh, current news and then speak about the history of ideas and then you're reaching um, ministerial competencies. There's a clear link um, between these requirements and Philosophy 101 and also um, we have the same figures in, or similar figures in terms of withdrawals and failures. So students do say that they, they like this format uh, it is not the be all and all, but we're not, you know, uh, we're not doing worse than we do usually. And um, it's also a learning opportunity for the teacher because uh, allowing students to learn by using topics that they are interested in, it has taught me a lot of stuff about, for example, uh, city politics, et cetera, et cetera. So the um, items that should be worked on regarding time, for example, it requires a lot of time to do implicit education. So we need to rework on that. We need to find a balance between um, uh, traditional teaching and then participatory, but uh, you're, you are you, we have to recognize, however, that uh, they don't uh, learn to argue just looking at PowerPoints. So it's, you know, it's worth working towards participatory implicit uh, learning. Also new uh, technologies and collective intelligence that uh, comprises some challenges. Uh, we have uh, some free writers always in the class because there's some collective work that's being done. Um, there's people who basically, you know, don't do the work, just uh, take it as a free ride. But we have found some strategies to reduce the number of people or of students who don't really participate or put in um, any effort or contribute. Um, so uh, positives here. Well, it is motivating for journalists. It is also a message of trust that we're sending to our students, telling us that they are already able to work uh, outside of the CEGEP and like publish our ideas and everything. Um, we've had a few productions up to now, a few uh, publications. It would be nice to have more. So this is what we need to work on. Also, there's different time frames. Um, education and journalism don't necessarily have the same deadlines, the same uh, rhythms, paces, etc. So students are not always uh, ready to do certain tasks, but there could be something to be done with a network. Uh, for example, students could decide to remain in the network once they're done with their um, Philosophy 101 class, and then they could uh, provide some help, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, now, other positives, uh, uh, the majority of predictions were successful. Also, um, we have demonstrated or we have seen a link between collective intelligence and the philosophical research uh, community. Uh, 
empirical research must continue, but also uh, there are social technical uh, mechanisms that come into play, not just epistemology. Um, so now uh, to be worked on, uh, we have time limitations. So, you know, it's hard to be critical when you don't have a lot of time, when time is uh, is not infinite. Um, motivation is essentially Right. Uh, so we need to uh, motivate the students more also because sometimes they take it as an exercise where the motivation is uh, essentially extrinsic. Uh, so we want uh, to them to participate, not just for the grade that they will get or not. Um, there we go. So um, this is another text that is uh, interesting. We were talking about odds. Um, the Tetlock uh numbers figures that we saw uh, they show that the reliability was from 30 to 40 percent so there are things there but there's something there but we can uh, improve that and now marie estelle andrean melissa um we uh, will continue our collective analysis to continue this work we also asked uh, for a grant uh, uh, to uh, keep uh, fighting against misinformation. And uh, we're going to do new tests to see how we can improve the project. So thank you for your attention. If you, if you have any questions or comments, uh, don't hesitate to write them down in the chat or write an email to me. I will be very happy to answer in writing or live right now. And uh, Melissa, would you like to answer this question Najwa was uh, asking, uh, what are the criteria to determine whether a result is objective? Uh, I, I wanted to answer directly, actually, I was asking him if he, if she uh, was asking about uh, predictions. Well, uh, objective results has to do with uh, whether or not whatever we're predicting did happen on the dat date that we're predicting it, right? Um, so, and this is why we absolutely need to frame predictions in the dates and in the, I say, frame your questions with numbers and dates that are clearly uh, accessible. For example, for the city bills, um, we were asking, you know, before the 15th of May, three cities from this region, et cetera, et cetera. And on the 16th of May, I wrote, uh, to um, the uh, municipalities to know exactly what had happened. And I learned that there was no more than three, um, that we hadn't reached three cities. So there, it was a question of yes or no. And uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Another question, it's inspiring. I'm wondering uh, how you uh, can introduce uh, the old thinkers in uh, uh, current news uh, discussions. I do it with environment, for example, but I always find that it's a bit artificial. Um, should I uh, stop sharing my screen now? Perhaps it will be more friendly if we can look at the videos, etc. Per perfect. Um, so uh, an answer, uh, Jean-François, first of all, yes, it is hard uh, not to be artificial. We need to always actualize a Greek thought, right? I'll give you a concrete example. We work uh, on the notice of interest on education, right? So of course it is kind of a classic, but um, not for nothing. We talk about the um, allegory, Plato's allegory, right? And one of the question uh, that was raised is uh, is it normal for there to be so much anxiety for superior studies? And uh, it was because it was shown that there was a lot of uh, anxiety regarding uh, superior studies, um, higher education. And uh, the idea was that they would make Plato take a position. Uh, so, so the student said, for example, well, you know, as uh, people in uh, the cavern came out uh, and were accessing to the world of knowledge, etc., was it easy for them? No, it wasn't easy. Um, it did induce some kind of anxiety for them, but was it worth doing it? Yes, it was worth doing it. So, you know, that was like uh, two uh, thousands of years later, um, but we could take a lesson from what Plato had said, and we could... Uh, 
uh, think about Epicure regarding happiness or um, Aristotle's uh, also uh, could bring us to think about if whether you respect function, you're um, happier, the function of a student, the, uh, then could allow the student to learn and make it accessible, make, make it acceptable to have a certain level like, of anxiety. Uh, so Jean-François, does that answer your question? And if it's not the case, then I'll be happy to go a bit further. So yeah, yeah. Thank you for your answer. Uh, I, I'm happy to know that you're cheating the same way that I'm, that I do. Um, all right, Elise Guerin Bouchard uh, would like to know about the research process uh, led by the students before formulating their predictions. Is research explicitly taught to them? The research aspect is not taught explicitly to them, but we use documents uh, provided by our librarians that you can. Uh, uh, find online and uh, on our platform, and uh, we'll look at the importance of uh, uh, finding hidden interests, uh, uh, checking your sources, when it was written, what date, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, okay, so yes, actually, yes, it is taught in part, uh, but when I speak about acceptability, um, it has to do with rationality criteria whether it is uh, likely plausible or not, you know, uh, who wrote it in one context, what date, etc. So uh, look at the sources. It is uh, taught explicitly because it has to do with acceptability, but structurally how to do research, you know, in the library versus the web or going to specialized reviews, we don't do that part. We don't do that part. It could be integrated, but because um, it's not... Uh, part of philosophy 101 per se, we don't do it for now. But um, some people go to the library, some profs go to the library and ask a librarian to give a presentation explicitly. I don't do it personally. Anyone want to add anything? My colleagues, uh, I hope that I'm answering your question. And if it's not the case, don't hesitate to follow up. I have another question from Eric Gagnon. Do you teach in your classes um, the bias? So, for example, uh, social, intellectual, uh, that can be present in your groups in order to avoid further prediction to be predictions to be biased. For example, the epistemic uh, bias of uh, the human being, um, inaudible, partly inaudible, our apologies. Uh, so it's interesting for this reference to be there, actually, because it was the one that I was going to uh, mention. What these authors say is that what makes people uh, not reason well today is that they're not in a context, they're not reasoning in a context where uh, evolution has led us. Uh, it's like we're telling people it's as if we're telling people that they're not breathing well underwater, but the thing is, is that we didn't develop, we didn't evolve in a way that would allow us to do that. So the thing is, we need to be in developing these abilities in a group and argumenting, arguing um, alone is not as good as uh, arguing in a dialogue with others when it's a when it's done in a structured way. So for me, it's very important to understand that arguing is a social activities and um, do I teach biases? No, because of Spicer and Mercier and uh, based on other authors that criticize other uh, works, I'm I'm answering you specifically, Eric. So Gierenzer criticizes Kahneman regarding um, biases where we recognize that our rationality is biased, whereas Sperber and Mercier uh, say our rationality is not biased, it's that it works in a context that is not the one that allows it to perform well. And this context is individually, so individuality. So when we bring people to work in uh, collectively, we're able to make them gain a better capacity for reasoning and uh, reach uh, more uh, reliable predictions. Um, so I don't teach biases, but because I am basing myself off of this uh, theory, um, I am addressing this this uh, issue in a way. Can I add something? Can you hear me well? Very well. Okay. 
Hello, my name is uh, Marie Estelle Debs. I will add something now. Um, I started the project with Jean-François and Andréanne um, this semester. And uh, so I covered it very quickly in the first class, the cognitive vices. Uh, and just to give you a little context, uh, or just give them a little context, a few examples. And then after that, when we go over argument, arguing, collective arguments uh, when uh, we're doing the uh, thinking abilities and um, prediction exercises uh, just so that they're aware that they, this can coexist and that our exercise or collective exercise is meant to um, fight biases. So I want them to be aware that there are biases, but that our collective exercise is meant to really fight against um, biases. So I make it clear that you know, we're trying to make it so that these biases exist less and less because we're going to be better predictors. We do or we acquire a better rationality as a group, as a collectivity, than if we think each of us isolated on our own. Yes, very good, excellent. And, and this makes me think of several things. Um, for example, we present uh, uh, system one, system two. Uh, I work less on biases, but what Maria said is bringing up is that, you know, the uh, project or the class is not a turnkey format, right? If you want to use it as is, perfect. I'm going to be so happy to share my material with you. But if um, you want to adapt it, and that's the best, you know, option, right? Because uh, the, 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 the point is to work critically and collectively. So Marie Estelle says, I don't necessarily work like you do. I don't necessarily work the same way. And that's great because we have these discussions and this way we train ourselves, each other, and we reflect on our own practices, right? So um, practices, and it makes us better teachers. Perfect. I have three more questions. We're going very well. So Najwa was asking questions regarding predictions. She says, when predictions coincide with the objective result, what conclusions do you draw? And if it doesn't, uh, have you, um, are you providing a remediation method? That is a super good question. Excellent. And um, when predictions do um, fit reality and uh, there are two options was it uh, uh, just was it because of our effective reasoning or was it uh, by chance right um so at that moment and we're talking about experiential teaching and this is part of the uh, has to do with the john john Dewey, um the theory right uh, what he says that you have to learn from experience. If you achieve something, you need to ask yourself if you achieved it by chance. And if you did, then where um, could you have improved without going into retrospective biases? Um, and you might have reached a certain uh, accurate conclusion by chance. You know, uh, if you say that there's 70 percent chances that uh, it will rain, if it doesn't rain, the problem is not that uh, meteorology Meteorologists uh, gave a poor forecast is because there was a 30% chance of them being wrong, right? So whether the predictions are good or bad, whether uh, they are verified or not, um, the idea is to have an analysis of how you reach your conclusions. And that's like a meta-analysis, right? A meta-conclusion. Um, so you can ask yourself where you erred, for example, um, in your cognitive process. So it's a metacognitive process in a way. I hope that I answered the question well and I didn't get lost. Um, it reminds me of the prediction from uh, Rafael, you know, the political analysts um, in the United States. He was assured that uh, Hillary Clinton would win and he found it very difficult. Oh yeah, he ate his socks. <laughs> yeah, but we can still see him on a TV screen today, but uh, it was a very, a uh, difficult lesson for him. Um, I am a Philosophy 101 um, prof. I'm very interested in a critical media production analysis. So do you have any uh, examples of work on the adaptation of epistemology or logic? For example, three cri criteria in class. So um, 
I'm not sure that I understand the question uh, and that I could answer it smartly. Marie Estelle, Melissa, did you answer it bef better than me? Oh, you can actually click on the uh, question and answer Q&A module. Oh, okay. Um, I imagine, Alphonse, uh, that we're, when they're talking about the three criteria, we're talking about the sufficiency, uh, acceptability, et cetera. You know, that exercise that we did in winter 2022 um, on the conspiracy video, right? Uh, analyzing the different arguments. And we had this huge board uh, that was reviewed by the different teams. Would that be an element? Would that be a good example of an exercise? Well, I can uh, give you this example, and if it doesn't answer your question, just don't hesitate to say so. But we, have, for example, took the Alexis Cosette Trudel uh, video, just one of them, because there's many of them, and people who don't know him, um, he is a person who is con considered as a conspirationist, a conspiracy theorist, very known. And we took the students from different classes, and we would, uh, have them work on a portion of the video and uh, this portion of the video they needed to extract the arguments from it without judging summarizing them without judging and then they needed to see if they um uh, complied with the rationality criteria uh, uh acceptability relevance and sufficiency so uh, these arguments that were given you needed to determine whether they were sufficient to actually adhere to the thesis presented by the author and even though that is a, a little uh, complicated uh, we would have different classes working on the same portions of the video and they could go and read over what other members of other groups uh, had done and so they would be able to uh, state their remarks right say you know we're going in the same direction uh, so I think that maybe we're headed the right way, or actually we don't agree because we didn't lead our analysis the same way. And then they could say why, et cetera, and then share. And then we would um, uh, reach a point where, where, where we would just have a collective document where we would have debunked uh, conspiracy videos minute by minute, second by second. We had 250 students, you know, and that's not a, it doesn't take so many groups to reach 250 students, by the way, there's 30 per class. So, and so all the work, the complexity of the work here is to divide up, to break down the epistemic analysis task, right? We haven't found exactly the right mechanism to do that yet. So we kind of abandoned this approach for now because there was a lot of um, technical manipulation, but it could be done. It could be done also with the city council. Um, you know, students could divide up the task in city councils, look at the arguments, look at the quality of these arguments, et cetera. So that was an example that I could provide. And then another one is that um, we had a conference in the CEGEP uh, where uh, provincial candidates uh came to present on environments and the students went to see their presentation and see each speaker each candidate uh, the arguments that they were presenting and applying these three rationality criteria we could have published that eventually but uh, since um there uh, there was a time you know a time frame uh, for relevancy for publications it was complicated you know we're only ready about three weeks after um the event and it would have been relevant if we'd published this like one day after the event so um there are two little questions left uh, no just one one and uh, it is probably marie andre the participant who's working at um at Election Quebec. So as in other places in the world, this is becoming, misinformation is becoming an obstacle to exercising one's rights in Quebec and in Canada. Um, so our institution wants to provide a healthy vigilance regarding news um, uh, in relation to our electoral or our election system. Um, so what do you think about these concerns? And uh, well, I, I completely agree. There is a lot of risk uh, associated with the misinformation in terms of democracy. I always tell my students the you know, what's a democracy, democratos, uh, power to the people. So if people um, are given the power, we want the 
uh, individuals to be rational, we wouldn't give a firearm to someone who's not trained, right? For example, a police officer. So we trained this person. Um, but uh, what could I say in relation to specifically um, misinformation is a problem, but I think that there is an underlying problem that is even more uh, significant, which is democratic disengagement. It is the idea that basically we can just treat any statement as true or false or plainly, I don't care. And it is very interesting to take into account that when we take Marie Martel's work, for example, she wrote uh, Extinction de Voix, um, so voice extinction. She uh, wrote about democratic institutions and media. Uh, and she said, if we lose our regional media because of economic models, we are going to have a less healthy democracy locally. And that is known. That is a fact. And um, so um, the objective here is uh, to, um, you know, even though regional newspapers are not profitable, they're not working in the current system, we need to find other resources, other sources in the civil society that will come and back up these uh, regional newspaper and bringing these students to participate in their own locality, their own uh, community. Um, I insist on this. I tell uh, students that they should go and participate in things that are close to them. They should take interest in their community and uh, eventually, you know, they should really get engage, mobilize, and become, this will lead them eventually, hopefully, to become better electors. Uh, so uh, fighting misinformation is important, but this will go through engagement. It is one of the ways that this will happen. Fighting misinformation will uh, happen through uh, disengage, uh, fighting disengagement. And um, so fighting misinformation usually happens with very explicit uh, methods, right? Saying, here is what is false. Don't believe it. Here is what is true. Believe this. And it is a work that is kind of like uh, the decryptors. It is a program, right? And I like their approach, but I think that they're wrong when they think that uh, explicit teaching is sufficient to fight behaviors linked to misinformation. What research actually says is that we need implicit, uh, explicit and implicit teaching uh, and learning in order to uh, modify behaviors. What we tell students here is let's search together, let's research together, and there is where that's where we're more likely to induce behaviors that are uh, likely to um to in to 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 make students um, better electors eventually and be able to fight misinformation um so yes well it was a compliment to the there was the last question it was it was just a compliment that last intervention so les décrypteurs i think that in any case they do show how uh, they proceeded to reach your conclusion right so it is an important part. It is. It is very important. But we're still in an approach that is a very traditional because uh, Les Décrypteurs, that program, they work in the way that media uh, speaks to spectators, to their audience. But it is one of the explanations, and, I, 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 and I'm not basing myself off literature here, but um, it might be an explanation why alternate alternative media in the uh, United States, alt-right media in the United States, even here in Canada, Quebec, is because these are media uh, streams where people rely on people, actually address people, right? They would tell people, go and find proof. Go and find proof, for example, during the, the Trump elections, um, or, or in the last elections, they would they would ask people to go find proof that Trump had won the election and that there was election fraud. Um, so people being asked to participate, uh, it's a very different format and it does engage people. But les décrypteurs, people who will not believe in the answer that is presented to them, will not believe us more if we ask them or or if we present something to them, something else to them. So I think that reflection, you know, thinking, uh, thinking ability is the best solution in order to be able to um, uh, analyze things better. So um, thank you very much, Jean-Francois. And uh, you can all take a second to thank Jean-Francois in the discussion space in the chat. Um, Marie-André did it um, via the Q&A. 
euh, Space, euh, Also, Marie-Estelle, Melissa, Andréanne, Marie-Ève. Um, it was very nice to have you here. And Jean-François, this really enlightened me and I'll be happy to have you again uh, during a conference or another webinar. And anyone, just don't hesitate to reach out to me, write to me. You had participants that were very uh, focused and very interested. Thank you, everyone.